Welcome back to CS162, everybody. We have some brave souls that are here uh, on the night before the exam, so that's great. Um, today, we're going to uh, briefly finish up something we didn't get to last time, and then we're going to dive into a new topic, which is scheduling. So, uh, however, if you remember from last time, among other things, we did a lot of talking about the monitor paradigm for synchronizing. And uh, a monitor is basically a lock and zero or more condition variables for managing uh, concurrent access to shared data. And monitors are a paradigm that we talked about. And some languages like Java actually provide monitors natively. Uh, for languages that don't have it natively, then uh, you can get a, a condition variable class that uh, integrates with a lock class. And you can program uh, with the monitor idea still. Um, and so a condition variable is kind of this key idea, which is a queue of threads waiting for something inside a critical section. So the key idea here is you allow sleeping inside the critical section uh, by sort of hiding the fact that you're going to atomically release the lock and, and reacquire it. And uh, this is in uh, contrast to semaphores, of course, where you can't wait inside the critical section. And uh, we talked about uh, the operations. There's three main ones. They have different names depending on the implementation, but uh, wait, signal, and broadcast are, uh, are the basic ideas there. And the rule is always you have to hold a lock when you do any sort of condition variable operations. And so um, this was the general pattern that we talked about for MESA scheduled uh, condition variables. Okay, and basically the idea is that you uh, typically grab the lock, you check some condition and potentially wait if, uh, if the condition's not succeeded. Because it's MESA scheduled, when we wake up from the wait, we always make sure to recheck the condition. So that's the while loop. And uh, really, that's because it's uh, possible that somebody will have gotten in and uh, made the condition invalid again before we actually got to start running again. And then you unlock. You do something. And then there's always a closing condition where uh, you grab the lock again. You maybe do some other things. But eventually, you're going to signal to make sure that anybody who is waiting is woken up and then you unlock. The key idea here is to be thinking uh, that you're always within the critical section. You grab the lock here, you release the lock there, and all the code that you see as a programmer between the lock and unlock um, are always considered to be executed with locks on. Okay, And of course, obviously, when you actually go to sleep under the covers, it releases the lock and then reacquires it before you start up again. All right, and then we spent uh, a fair amount of time last time using this pattern to solve the reader's writers problem. Um, so I wanted to see whether there were any questions on monitors before we kind of move on. Any remaining questions at all? Okay, good. So, um, the thing I wanted to finish up last time, so I was uh, at the very end of the lecture kind of showing you some uh, you know, examples of scheduling of threads within the kernel. Uh, here, the one thing I did want to do was uh, talk a little bit about the I.O. portion of uh, the I.O. interface, because we didn't talk about that earlier in the term. And if you were really to look at the layers of I.O. that we've talked about, there is this, at the user application level, you might execute a read, which is a raw interface level that translates directly to a system call inside the libc library. That system call basically marshals the arguments together into registers, calls a syscall, and then uh, the results of the syscall uh, are then returned from this read system call as if it were like a function. It really is kind of like a function that calls the kernel. Um, you're getting familiar with this now, uh, with project one, of course. And then inside, uh, that system call is a type of exception, but uh, the same thing happens if you have interrupt processing. But that goes into the system call handler, where you unmarshal or take apart the uh, arguments, and then you dispatch a handler based on what you're trying to do. So it might be dispatched based on the fact that this was a system call uh, to a read, for instance. And then you marshal the results back, and you return them from the system call. And then one layer deeper, when we dispatch on this read, we might actually call something called VFS read inside the kernel, which takes the uh, description file uh, structure for that file and a buffer and a few other things. Um, and it basically 
does the file access, maybe calls a device driver in the process. So I wanted to look a little deeper in these lower layers here, just so you've seen them once or twice. It's gonna be useful as we get further into project two and three. Um, you should know there's many different types of I.O., um, but as we were talking earlier in the term, uh, the Unix uh, way or the POSIX way basically treats all of these like file I.O., okay? And so uh, that system call interface, read, write, open, close, uh, basically translates into calls across the system call boundary in the kernel. That's this blue thing right now. Um, and depending on what we're calling, whether it's, say, a file system, actual uh, storage in block devices, or maybe it's device control, like a, a serial link, that's what the TTYs are, keyboard, mouse, um, or it's network sockets, the same open, close, read, write system calls are used. And the question might be, well, so how does that work, okay? And that's the magic of standardized API. So the magic of the standardized API is arranging so that all of these very different things can all be accessed as if they were files, all right? And the, you know, internally, there's this file description structure, which represents an open device being accessed like a file. Uh, when we return a file descriptor as an integer, as you recall, that file descriptor that the process knows about is mapped as a number, is mapped inside the kernel to one of these structures, okay? So this is the internal data structure describing everything about the file. We re haven't really talked too much about it. We mentioned it once before, and you've probably strayed into it, uh, the equivalent of this in Pintos now. Um, and uh, it talks about everything having to do with that device, like where the information resides, uh, its status, and how to access it. And it's, um, you know, in the kernel, typically what gets passed around is a pointer to this uh, file structure. It's a, it's a struct file star. Um, and everything is accessed with that file structure. And, uh, you know, we can't give that file structure to the user. Why is that? Why can't we give that pointer up to the user? Does anybody know why that? Because it's in kernel memory, exactly. So those addresses don't mean anything to users. And the capital file stars we've talked about are different from this. The capital file star represents buffered user level memory buffering a file. This structure represents the actual uh, internal implementation of the file. And you see something here, which we're not gonna talk about today, called an inode. So when we start talking about how file systems are implemented, uh, the inode's gonna come up a lot, but that inode can point at a, a wide variety of things, not just file blocks. And the thing of interest here for today that I wanna talk about is this file operations uh, structure uh, which is the F underscore op uh, item in this file structure. And that basically describes how this device implements its operations. So for disks, it points to things like file operations in the file system. For pipes, it points to uh, pipe operations. I noticed uh, there were some uh, questions on Piazza about, well, how does a pipe uh, get implemented in the kernel? Where is it? Well, it's a, it's a queue inside the kernel. And how do you access it? Well, you access it because the file structure is uh, pointed at by, um, excuse me, the file structure points at both the queue in the kernel and has a set of operations on how to read, write, et cetera, for the, um, for the pipe, all right? And for sockets, it points to socket operations, okay? So the cool thing about this is really that by putting this layer of indirection in here, um, you basically get the ability to have everything look like a file from the user's level, okay? And all of the complexity is buried in this simple idea, this simple interface. So for instance, here's an example of what that file structure looks like uh, for those of you out there. So here are the set of operations that are standardized, things like seeking, reading, writing bytes. There's uh, asynchronous IO, reads and writes, et cetera. Okay, how to open a directory or read a directory. Um, how to open, how to flush, and so on. These standardized operations are the ones that devices that want to look like files to the user have to provide. Um, all right. And, uh, you know, so for instance, I think I, um, I don't know if I had this slide or not, but for instance, for a pipe, uh, there are two different file structures uh, that are hard coded in the pipe implementation 
for the file operations, one for the read end and one for the write end, and things like the read end uh, don't have write uh, calls, and things for the write end don't have read calls. Okay. So this VFS read that I showed you, the virtual file system read, uh, we'll talk a lot more about this in detail later in the term. But uh, what it's got, for instance, is uh, this is where the read system call goes. And it says, for instance, it takes the file star in. Okay, and then it says read up to count bytes from the file starting at the position uh, that's uh, kept at in the file star into the buffer that's given here. And it returns an error or the number of bytes read. Um, here's an example of something that says, well, if we're trying to read, uh, do we have read access or not? Okay. Um, check if the file has read methods, right? If we try to read something that doesn't know how to read, then we're gonna fault. So a good example of that would be trying to read from the right end of a pipe, for instance. Um, and the other thing is that's very important that you've uh, started to do uh, in project one, or probably should have been doing already, is uh, check the user's buffer is actually accessible to it, okay? And if the user doesn't really have access to the buffer, he wants to put things in, um, then, uh, Basically, this will fault. Okay, and then um, you know, can we actually read from the file? That's another question. Range, um, and then we check, and if there's uh, read operations, we do it uh, using the the um, specific read operations. Otherwise, we do what's called a synchronous read, which will use the provided uh, asynchronous data or asynchronous operations to read from it. And then um, when we're done, we notify the parent that something was read. So this is sort of when you see file browsers um, that you have open on the screen and you create a new file, you'll suddenly see the file will pop up in the file browser while there's notification going on inside the file system. Um, we'll update the number of bytes read by the current task. So this is sort of scheduling information. Um, we'll talk about schedulers in a bit for CPU cycles, but it's possible that um, we're, and it's probable that we're scheduling also the number of bytes we're pulling off a file system and we may, choose to uh, suspend a process that's reading more than we desired from the, uh, at a given time. Um, and then we uh, update the number of read calls, again, some statistics, and we return, okay? So the idea here is that everything at the top level has been designed in a way to be uh, easily plug and played from a wide variety of devices underneath. All right, any questions on that? All right, so um, underneath the covers, even further below than what we showed here, let me just back up, whoops. If you look here, um, I wanted to show you, what did I wanna show you? Oh, yeah, so in this um, many different types of IO, we have the high level interface, which we've just been talking about. And then at the bottom, we have the devices and somewhere in the middle, we have to have things that know how to interface with all the unique characteristics of the devices and provide enough standardized interface up to interface with the, the kernel, okay? And those are, as you probably are well aware, called device drivers. So going back to where we were here, so what a device driver is, is it's driver uh, device specific code in the kernel that interacts directly with the device. And it provides a, a standardized internal interface up, which is not surprisingly gonna be very close to those uh, file operations I showed you earlier. Um, and the same kernel I.O. at that lower level can easily interact with different devices. So the device driver level is gonna give us the uh, ability to interact identically with, say, a USB uh, key that you might plug into a USB port versus a disk drive that's spinning. They have the same kind of interface in the kernel after you get out of the device driver, okay? And the device driver is also gonna provide the special device specific configuration from the IOCTL system calls. Uh, we uh, gave you a good example of, well, if you got a device that yes, it does open, close, read, write, but there's some special configuration that doesn't fit into that standardized interface, then you'll typically use the IOCTL calls for that device to set things, like you might set resolution on a display or, uh, or baud rate on a serial link. And the device driver typically has two pieces to it. There's a top half and a bottom half. The top half of the device driver, which is uh, interfacing up into the kernel, uh, is accessed at a call path from system calls. Um, and it implements a standard cross device calls. These are gonna sound very familiar to the 
to you from the FOPS we were just talking about earlier. Um, this is a slightly different layer, a little bit lower, but it also supports open, close, read, write, ioctal. It also uh, has a strategy routine, which is typically the way that you start I.O. starting. And so, for instance, if the file system design, uh, decides that there's some number of blocks that need to be pulled out of the file system, then uh, this, once that's been determined, then the strategy routine can be uh, put together to start the actual I.O. happening. So that's the top half. And the, the thing about the top half is that uh, processes that are running or threads uh, can go all the way through to the top half. And if the I.O. doesn't actually have to happen, they can return from that and return to the user. But if the I.O. happens to have to happen to a slow device, then the top half is potentially going to put things to sleep. Okay, and the bottom half runs pretty exclusively as an interrupt routine. Okay, so it gets input or transfers the next block of output based on interrupts that have occurred. And it may wake sleeping threads in the top half if the I.O. is now complete. Okay, and so here's a, an example of a, a, an I.O. request coming from the user where the user wants to, let's say, do a read. So um, the, the user program at the top here is gonna request some I.O. That might be a read system call, or it might be a, an F read or whatever in the buffered I.O. And um, that's going to cross into the kernel. So that's doing a system call. And the first thing the kernel is going to do with, a, say, a disk drive file system situation is it's going to say, well, can I already satisfy the request? OK. And if the answer is yes, then it'll immediately uh, copy the results into the user's buffer and return up. Can anybody uh, tell me why it, the kernel might be able to immediately satisfy a request from the user? What, what, might, what might be the reason that we could say yes? Cache, yes, so, or buffer. So it's quite, for the simplest way to think about this is if I execute read uh, 13 bytes at a time to a, di a file system, the disk is transferring blocks that are four to 16K in size. So my 13 bytes may re bring in a whole, let's say 4K at a time, and that'll be put in a cache, and there's a couple of different places of cache we'll talk about as we uh, get further into this later in the term. Uh, but that cache is going to hold the whole 14 kilobytes. And so um, the first time that may return that and take a little while to go to the disk and return to the user. But the next time for the next 13 bytes, it's already in the cache. Okay. So, um, but assuming that's not true, then we're going to, we realize we got to do some actual IO to an actual device. So this is the point at which we're going to try to send the request to the device driver and potentially put the, the uh, process to sleep at that point, OK, or the thread. And um, when we get uh, to the top half of the device driver, it sort of takes the request and it figures out how did that translate to the particular blocks that need to be read off the disk. Um, and when we talk about file systems, you'll get an idea of where the, you know, how we figure out which blocks. And then it's going to put that thing to start the, start the actions with the disk drive and then put things to sleep. And that's going to be the place where, for instance, the strategy routine takes over. But uh, at the point that the top, uh, the device driver is done and has sent the request to the device, it then puts the thread to sleep. So you could say that the thread kind of started at the user and worked its way all the way down to the top half of the device driver and it's now sleeping. Okay. And meanwhile, um, yeah, that's a really good question. Does the device driver have its own process? Not exactly. Uh, so notice that everything I've talked about here is kind of running in uh, response to the processes request of the system call. And so it's running on that processes kernel stack. And eventually, we get to this point where we can't go any further. And what happens there is that kernel stack or kernel thread gets put to sleep by being put on a wait queue with the uh, with the disk, and then another thread will be scheduled to run, OK? Um, but the, the thing that has run up to this point has actually been the kernel thread of that user process. Now, you might another reason you might say whether it has its own process is, OK, so nothing's running anymore. What happens? Well, we've asked the device to go ahead and start executing. So the device is off doing its own thing. And eventually, when it's done, um, possibly uh, transferring the data into memory through, through something called DMA. We'll get there again a little later in the term. Uh, it will generate an interrupt 
to tell the, uh, the system it's time to, to wake up. And that interrupt is going to go to the bottom half of the device driver, which is now going to figure out uh, who might be sleeping waiting for that block, in which case it's going to determine who needs the block, and it's going to wake up that process. And from that point, the process now, the original process, which uh, you know, was kernel thread put to sleep, now wakes up and says, oh, let's transfer the data to the process's uh, buffer and then return from the read system call. OK. So any questions on that? Now, there's a lot of interesting details in here, which we haven't talked a lot about yet. But for instance, the uh, process of sending, no pun intended, the act of sending requests to that device it's possible that the device driver is going to uh, take a set of requests from a set of different processes and reorder them uh, using something, for instance, often called an elevator algorithm, so that uh, the, the requests uh, do the, uh, the least amount of head movement. OK, but that's, that's a topic for another day. Right now, we're just talking about the device driver. OK, so uh, that's what I wanted to say about device drivers. I think the important things to get out of this for now is this idea that it's the kernel thread associated with the requesting thread that uh, is, gets put to sleep. And assuming that uh, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between the user thread and the kernel thread, uh, and there's a post that I did on that last night in Piazza as well, then putting the, the thread to sleep here in the, the, the I.O. is OK because all the other threads have their own kernel threads and get to keep going. On the other hand, if we had a bunch of user threads running uh, in this environment, let's say, if any one of them were to do I.O. that got put to sleep, then all of those user threads associated with that one kernel thread get put to sleep. OK, so that's, uh, that's the danger of sort of multiple of the many to one model where multiple user threads are associated with a single kernel thread. OK, good. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, I will make sure you know tomorrow is a, our first exam. Uh, it's five to seven, um, as been stated. Um, we have some special uh, dispensation for 170 folks. Um, this is video proctored. I know uh, there was a lot of people that were worried about having to prop their cell phone and so on. So there's been a bit of an update on what we're uh, asking of you, but um, we definitely do need the webcam uh, turned in and you logged into Zoom with screen sharing while you're doing this. Um, and uh, the more details are, are up on the pinned Piazza link. So hopefully everybody's got that figured out now. Um, the topics for this exam are pretty much everything up to Monday. Now, I know we originally said everything up to uh, lecture eight, but really lecture nine was mostly a little bit of a continuation of lecture eight. We spent some time um, looking at monitors in a little bit more detail. So um, scheduling, which is the today's topic for the rest of the day, is not part of the exam. So don't worry about that. Um, homework and project work is definitely fair game. Um, so the other thing is the materials you can use during this exam. This is closed book, closed friends, closed random internet people, uh, no open uh, channels with folks. Um, you're allowed to use your brain. Uh, yeah, you can use your personal device drivers, which hopefully will drive your fingers properly when you're typing answers in. Um, you can have a single cheat sheet that you've written both sides, uh, and you can uh, eight and a half by 11 handwritten. Um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Oh, are device drivers in scope? Uh, you're, um, they're not going to be in scope on the exam. So things, things from today that didn't get talked about uh, on Monday are not in scope. Um, but you're, you're allowed to use the device drivers in your fingers as well. OK. Any other questions? Yes, so there will be a sheet at the end. I think there was even a Piazza post showing you what it was like. But uh, there will be a sheet with uh, important uh, system calls and function call signatures that you need to know. Um, but it, won't hurt to, it wouldn't hurt to know the ones that you've been using a lot in your project uh, scope, just in case we forgot to give you one. So. All right, um, and things that like thread creation and so on. If you don't remember the exact um, 
signature and we didn't give it to you, then uh, do your best to come up with the, uh, the signatures that you need. I think we've been pretty good about that, but if we forgot something, uh, you know, you know what the signature should look like pretty much because you've been using it. So I think you'll be okay. If you've got some arguments slightly reordered, uh, that's okay. All right. But most of the things that you need signatures on, we will give you um, for system level things. Okay. Now, if there aren't any more questions about the midterm, uh, let's go on to topics for today. I'll pause one last time here. How hard is it? Uh, just perfect, uh, perfectly not too hard, not too easy, just the right amount for the time that you have to do it. I don't know. Uh, so um, I would say use your primary monitor. Okay. All right. Um, if uh, in terms of printing the exam, it's an online thing unless you've talked to us uh, and have special uh, have some special arrangement. So it's it's going to be an online exam. You'll be able to uh, put your answers in, and when you save on an answer, it holds on to it for you, so there won't be any losing of answers or anything like that. All right. Okay, and all those details should be posted already. So you should take a look, make sure you're ready with any setup in terms of being able to log into uh, getting your Zoom set up and so on. You should uh, probably try that out tomorrow or tonight, whatever, just to make sure you're ready. Okay, today I wanna switch topics a little bit, but it isn't really that big of a switch. We've been talking about uh, how the mechanisms for going from one thread to another, okay? And we talked, uh, a lot about that uh, over the course of the last, you know, nine lectures. And um, the one thing we didn't really talk about is how do you decide which thread to switch to? Okay, and that's, uh, that turns out to be an extremely interesting topic. So, you know, I'm showing you a loop here. This loop kind of represents everything there is about a thread, or excuse me, everything there is about the operating system, which does a continuous loop and it basically says, if there are any ready threads, pick the next one, run it. Otherwise, run an idle thread, and the idle thread is typically just a kernel thread that does nothing, keeps some statistics. And we just keep doing this over and over again, and the question about how frequently do I loop, and when do I cut somebody off and pick somebody else, uh, or how do I choose between the, uh, the 12 things that are ready to run, that's all scheduling, and it's interesting scheduling because there are many policies, many different reasons for choosing one thing over another, and so scheduling is actually a really uh, a deep topic that we um, spend a couple of lectures on because it's interesting. Um, and another uh, figure that I showed you a while back is this one, which is kind of showing the CPU busy potentially exiting or executing stuff. And every now and then something happens so that the current thread that's running in some process has to stop, okay? And examples of that are, for instance, um, if we do some I.O., we were just talking about that a moment ago, where the CPU enters the device driver to do some I.O., and the device driver puts it to sleep. You get put on the queue with that I.O., and you gotta wait for the I.O. to happen. So that's an example of the CPU uh, relinquishing the thread that's running and putting that, that kernel thread on, uh, on a queue. And of course, the thing that has to happen immediately after that is, well, let's go to the ready queue and pull somebody else to run because we don't want to waste CPU cycles. And the other thing that's kind of interesting here is we're busy running along and the timer goes off. And at that point, we say that the time slice has expired and we put that item, um, that thread that was running back on the ready queue because its time is up, but you know we got to pull somebody off the ready queue to put it on the CPU. Okay, and then of course when we're doing fork or we're doing some other uh, scheduling or so on, uh, excuse me, some other synchronization that requires interrupts, uh, we can be pulled off the CPU as well. And the real question of scheduling is how's the OS to decide which of several tasks to take off the queue? And um, you know, it's not, if if you didn't learn about this, you might easily say, well, this is dumb. You just pick the next one. Uh, why is that interesting? Well, the answer is that picking the next one is, is uh, 
rarely the right thing to do. You can have what's called a FIFO scheduler, and of course we'll talk about that one first, but that's not the best thing to do. Um, there may be many other things where you got to pick the one that is uh, got highest priority for some reason, or you pick the one that's more likely to make you typing at the keyboard happy because your keystrokes get registered. Okay, and so scheduling is this idea of deciding which threads are given access to the resources moment to moment. And for certainly these next couple of lectures, we're going to be talking about CPU time is the resource we're talking about. But in fact, very interesting scheduling happens with respect to disks. We could say, well, I've got a set of tasks and I want to make sure everybody gets equal bandwidth out of the disk drive. Okay, so that's a scheduling uh, priority of requirement, okay, for policy. Um, but today and, you know, and next time, we're definitely going to be talking about the CPU. Okay. So, you know, we're all big fans of, of uh, queues of various sorts. Um, and uh, here's a FIFO queue that looks like uh, they're not social distancing. So this is uh, a picture from a little while ago. Um, so what are some assumptions? Well, in the 70s, maybe this is a picture from the 70s. So in the 70s, scheduling was kind of a big area of research. Um, computers were new enough that people hadn't really figured things out. And um, the, the usage models were, were pretty basic because people had mainframes in big rooms and uh, those were multi-million dollar machines and you had a bunch of people using them. And so you had to somehow make sure that those million dollar, super million dollar resources were properly shared among different users because they were just expensive and you couldn't let a user uh, take too much time, but you also couldn't let a user who's maybe spent money for computer time be upset uh, because they're not getting their fair share. And so the thing that's interesting is there is a lot of implicit assumptions in these original CPU scheduling algorithms of things like the following, one program per user, okay, or one process maybe per user, um, one thread per program, programs are totally independent of each other. Um, these kind of ideas are certainly not the case anymore, but they're a good place to start when we sort of dive into scheduling. Um, so these are a bit unrealistic, but they do simplify the problem uh, so it can be solved initially. So for instance, the question might be, what's fair? Um, is it is fair about fairness among users or about programs? So uh, if you think about it, if you have one user and uh, they have five programs and a different user has one program, how do you share the CPU? Do you share that by cutting it in sixths and giving one sixth to each, uh, each program? So now the user, just by having multiple programs, gets more of the, of the CPU than the user who only has one program. Okay, so that's a type of fair, which is fairness per process, but it's not fair per user, right? Um, you know, if I run one compilation job and you run five, then you get five times as much CPU as I do. Is that fair? I don't know. Um, the high level goal, of course, is still doling out CPU time because when we do this swapping from user one to user two to user three to user one to user two to user three, or we, earlier we saw these were threads or their processes, we need to decide which one's next. And we got to do that with some policy in mind. And the interesting thing, hopefully you'll figure out by the end of the lecture is, there pretty much isn't one policy that goes well for every situation. And it's, it's often the cases where people have tried to come up with a single scheduler that wor to, to work across a wide variety of platforms that things have gotten in trouble and not worked well for un any of the platforms. So one thing that we might use as a model for this, here's an interesting idea, which is burst time or CPU burst. And what you look here on, what you see on the left, is the idea that we run for a while and then uh, we go to wait for some IO and then we run a little longer and we wait for some IO and we run a little longer and we wait for some IO. And in each of those instances, um, during the waiting, of course, we're on some queue, okay? Because we can't run. And so we're off the ready queue and pretty much other people get CPU time. And so the execution model is really that programs are alternating between bursts of CPU and bursts of IO. And what's interesting is if you were to measure that on some system, this is totally unnamed here for a moment, and you were to put burst time on the x-axis, and uh, how often you see a burst time 
uh, of that size, you see there's a, a peak at the lower end, but a really long tail. Okay, now, just to be clear, in case you're wondering again, what do I mean by this x-axis? I mean that if you look at this thing on the left and you say, I run for amount, some amount of time before I go to sleep, that some amount of time is, is on this x-axis, okay? And so some of them are really short. Like for instance, if I type, what does that do? I type a character, it generates an interrupt, there's an interrupt routine that's run, that character maybe gets forwarded through the windowing system to a, to a thread that's waiting for it. And then that thread goes to sleep waiting for the next thing. And that might be a very short burst because the amount of work that happened for typing a character is short. On the other hand, certainly you have some processes that might be running for a long time, like computing the next digit of pi. They're gonna be way out at the end of the long tail. And so if you were to look at the set of tasks, you'd find that there's a, it's weighted toward the small burst because there's a lot of those little ones. And furthermore, you might infer that those little ones have something to do with interacting with users. Okay, so programs typically use CPU for a period of time and then do IO and then keep going. And scheduling decisions about which job to give the CPU to uh, might be based on burst time. Can anybody think what might be a policy that we should use based on burst time for scheduling CPU? What might be a good one and can you think of a reason? Okay, give the long duration first. Okay, that would be one policy. So why? So if I gave the long durations first, that means that things that are short duration are potentially waiting a very long time, right? So the long duration first might give me a lot of efficiency because I'm using the processor cache as well, but it's gonna really be uh, a bad impact on the short burst ones because they're just gonna run quickly and finish, right? So, okay, we could go pseudo randomly, sure. Can anybody give a justification for why we might want to optimize for the short ones? What might be a good reason to try to optimize for the short bursts? So we have maximize the number of processes that get to go in a fixed time. That could be one idea. There you go, I saw somebody that said for responsiveness, there you go. Because if those low bursts are about interacting with users and they're short, I wanna handle them quickly because uh, the users get the big benefit of seeing their, you know, they type the letter A and then it shows up on the screen quickly. And the long ones are hardly gonna notice if you uh, hold them up for a moment to run a short one, okay? And so really optimizing for short bursts may have something to do with responsiveness. And um, I will uh, say something that uh, will surprise you a little bit, but maybe you've run into this in shared resources. But back when I first started writing papers uh, and I was using a mainframe to do it, there were a bunch of people that logged in and we had such a high load with so many people logged in that when I had a Emacs up and I started typing, uh, you know, you might type, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question. And then a second later or three seconds later, the whole, the whole phrase would show up. So the, the scheduling was so bad that you could type whole sentences and then it would pop up on the screen. Okay. And so that's not very responsive. And you can imagine as we've gotten more and more in a situation where people are, um, you know, have CPUs of their own. So they have lots of cell phones and other things, you're gonna to wanna to be uh, cognizant of responsiveness. Okay, so, so what are some goals that we might have for scheduling? So for instance, uh, and yeah, the sum of the waiting time is gonna be the smallest. That's gonna be a, a metric that we're gonna use in a moment, so that's very good. So um, minimizing response time, okay? We wanna minimize the elapsed time to do some operation or job. And um, the response time is really what the user sees. It's the time to echo a keystroke in the editor. It's the time to compile a program. And for real-time tasks, which we're not gonna to get to real-time today, we'll do that next time, but um, you have to meet deadlines imposed by the world. So uh, my, my favorite example of this is uh, most cars these days have hundreds of, of little miniature CPUs in them. 
And I want to make sure that when I slam on the brakes in my car, that uh, the system is responsive and applies the brakes <laughs> quickly and timely so that I don't smash into whatever I was trying to avoid. So there's a real time deadline in that scenario where it's, just, it's not just keeping me happy as a user, it's keeping me alive, right? So that's, we can get into real time where the deadlines are far more important than the kind we've been talking about up till now. We'll talk about that next time. Um, another scheduling uh, thing which tends to be in the big cloud services is maximizing throughput. So this is completely different than minimizing response time. Maximizing throughput is about saying, I want to maximize the number of operations or jobs per second. And the throughput is related to response time, but it's not identical. Um, and uh, minimizing response time leads to more context switches because to minimize response time, what's happening is I'm handling a whole bunch of really short jobs and then a long one for a while and then a whole bunch of short ones. And as a result, I'm context switching a lot. And as you know, context switching has an overhead associated with it. And so I'm actually not getting the maximum throughput when I'm context switching. Okay. Now there's two parts to maximizing throughput. One is minimizing the overhead, which is not context switching much. And the other is very efficient uh, use of resources like the CPU, disk, memory, et cetera. And a key on this, which uh, is something to start putting into your viewpoint here and thinking about is by not context switching uh, a lot, not only do I avoid uh, overhead, but I also avoid disturbing important things like cache state. Okay, so um, in 61C, you talked about the power of caches. We'll talk about the power of caches when we get to file systems. But by not switching, but rather running for long periods of time, what I do is I get a chance for the cache state to build up and then for me to take advantage of it. So high throughput uh, is often in direct contrast to response time. Those two are conflicting with each other. Um, another one which is really funny is fairness. You know, what does that mean? Uh, and there's so many different versions of fairness. Uh, you could say, well, roughly I'm sharing the CPU among users in some fair way. But fairness is not about minimizing average response time because the way I get better average response time is by making the system less fair. Anybody tell me why that would be? So why is better average response time achieved at make, by making the system less fair? That makes sense to anybody? There you go. People who make more requests because they have a lot of bursts get priority and they get priority over other users. So the mere act of having bursts gives you more CPU, okay? And I'm gonna give you a funny instance if we get to that today of uh, somebody in the early days of computer, um, Othello for instance, playing each other uh, figured out that by putting print statements into their uh, Othello code, they could get more CPU time than the other guy and get an advantage. So, so let's start with the first obvious thing here, which is first come first serve or FIFO. Um, and really you could think of this as run until done. So in really early systems, first come first serve basically meant uh, you submit your programs in a big queue at night and you'd come in in the morning and they would have run uh, one after another and FIFO order. Now that was the original notion. You ran everything to completion. Today, we basically run the CPU uh, until the thread blocks. So what it says is if you have a, a queue, the ready queue, um, you put things on the end of the ready queue when you get pulled off the CPU or woken up from IO, and then the, the scheduler just grabs the next one off the head and keeps going down the queue one at a time in FIFO order, okay? And so to show you what this means, here's a Gantt chart. I'm sure you guys have run into these before, but it's basically showing uh, a set of a sequence of events in time. Um, and what we're seeing here is an example where uh, three processes, P1, P2, P3, came in uh, to the queue, the ready queue. The first one had a burst time of 24. The second one had a burst time of three. The third one had a burst time of three. And so we run for, um, 24 until the burst is done, then we run for three, then we run for three. And um, if we were to view the users of these processes, uh, we can ask ourselves, what's the waiting time uh, for them? Okay, so process one doesn't wait at all. 
okay, because they start right away. Process two has to wait 24 time cycles, whatever this is. Process three has to wait 27. And so we could average the waiting time there by so zero plus 24 plus 27 over three, and that's 17. And we can talk about average completion time, right? P1 ends at uh, 24, P2 ends at 27, P3 ends at time 30, and that gives us an average completion time of 27. So um, this average waiting time and average completion time end up being metrics that we could optimize for if that turned out to be something we wanted to do. Now, the big problem with first come, first serve scheduling, there are many problems, but let me just show you uh, the, the biggest one here is what's called the convoy effect, which is short processes are stuck behind long ones. This is also the um, you know, five or less item problem at uh, Safeway, where you come and you, you only want uh, you know, a bottle of milk and some chips, and you try to go in the short line and some person in front of you has decided that their cart full of 50 items fits into the five item requirement, you've just succumbed to the convoy effect because you are now serialized behind that long job, okay? And so here's the convoy effect with uh, first come, first uh, serve scheduling. What happens is we see when arrivals are coming here. So the, the, here the arrivals are showing up. This is the actual execution at the top. We had a blue one executing, and then the green one arrived uh, at this point, and the green one doesn't get to start until that point, and so on. And now the, the uh, dark green one gets to run, okay? And then the red one shows up, and the blue one shows up, but now the red one is long, all right? Um, and so that blue powder blue one now is stuck for a very long time. So if you look at the queue here, that's what's going to build up. The red one is now running, but now the blue one is, is queued, and another one comes along, and another one comes along, and another one comes along, and all of these tasks are stuck while the red one is running, and then when it finishes, they all finish out pretty quickly. So this is a convoy of jobs that are all stuck waiting for some long job. That's why it's called the convoy effect, okay? All right? And the funny thing about this is if I were to just switch the order of what I showed you earlier, where I showed you P1, P2, P3, if they were to come into P2, P3, P1, then look what happens here. P2 um, gets to run quickly, P3 gets to run quickly, and then uh, P1 runs. And so the waiting time for P1 is now six. So notice that P1 only has to start six units of time before it starts running. P2 has zero and P3 has three. The average waiting time now is six plus zero plus three over three, which is three. The average completion time is three plus six plus 30 over three, which is 13. And uh, if you compare for what we had before, just because P1 arrived first before rather than last, notice that uh, we had an average waiting time of 17 when P1 showed up first, now it's only three. We had an average completion time of 27 when P1 showed up, now it's 13. So you can see that uh, first come first serve or FIFO has this problem that uh, you know it's very uneven as to how you service things. Okay. So the pros and cons of this are um, you know short jobs get stuck behind the long ones is a definite con. It's simple, okay. So that's a pro, but um, and it's going to be the simplest we come up with in this uh, set of lectures. But um, this is really the safe way get the milk effect. Um, you know, um, I guess the good thing is you can sort of read the, the rags there while you're waiting for that other person to get through and find out about the, the space aliens that have landed somewhere in uh, Nebraska. But um, it's always getting the milk. Yep, the mil milk is, is the important thing here in uh, operating systems. Okay, we haven't spilled any yet though, so we'll have to see what, uh, what happens when we spill the milk. But all right, so let's see if we can do better. Okay, because this, this, uh, Unevenness with scheduling it seems like a downside at minimum, and uh, and then you know there's got to be something better. So the simple thing we can do is what's called round robin scheduling, and um, this is going to be our very first stab at fixing first come first serve, and um, really the first come first serve. I mean let, let's look at this. This is potentially very bad for short jobs, which is going to be very bad for responsiveness to users, right? Here I'm showing you the best first come first serve. The previous Worst first come first serve was extremely bad and we don't know are we gonna be responsive or not. And that just seems, it's gonna annoy the users, right? 
And so um, wh what else can we do? So that's a Robin there because, you know, I can do cut and paste um, and, and put in clip art. But the round robin scheme is going to be all about preemption. Okay, so every process is going to get a small amount of CPU time. And uh, we're going to call that a time quanta. In typical operating systems today, it's 10 to 100 milliseconds. And we're only going to let jobs run for a time quanta, and then we're going to preempt them and move on to the next one. Okay, so after the quanta ex expires, timer is going to go off. This should sound familiar to everybody. The process is going to be preempted, and it's going to be uh, put on the end of the ready queue, and the next one in FIFO order is going to be pulled off the front. And this preemption is going to uh, give us different behavior. Now, we can do some analysis very quickly uh, about this, right? So if we have n processes in the system, um, then uh, this is, uh, we can figure out that every process, if it's running for a long time, gets one over nth of the CPU time. Okay, and yes, this is a, as uh, said on the chat, a quantum leap in scheduling. <laughs> so in chunks of at most Q time units, uh, we can see basically if there's n processes in time, uh, chunks of Q time units, that no process is ever going to wait for n minus 1 times Q time units. So there is now a minimum, uh, excuse me, uh, there's a maximum amount of time we have to wait, which is going to mean that uh, we have so, sort of a minimum level of responsiveness that we can get out of the system at least, so as to not uh, annoy users too much. Now, the system I talked about earlier where I was typing and whole sentences took a long time to show up was still like this, but it was a situation where n was so large that this time got too large. Okay. Um, so what about round robin scheduling? So the performance, well, if Q is extraordinarily large, that's the quantum time, we, we reconverge back to first come, first serve, right? If Q is really small, we interleave. Okay, and that actually, I guess if you thought really small, you might think of this almost like what the hardware hyperthreading does. Um, so Q clearly has to be big enough that the overheads don't kill us. So the context switching isn't the only thing we do. We actually do some computation, but it can't be too big or we don't get the benefits from a responsiveness standpoint. So here's an example of a round robin with time quantum equal 20. So I have a set of four processes here. I'm going to show you the Gantt chart for this. Uh, process one's got a burst time of 53. Process two, 80. Uh, excuse me. Let's try that again. Process one has burst time of 53. Process two has eight. Process three has 68. And process four has 24. And so process one, being the first one to arrive, runs for 20. And the, and the timer goes off. OK? And the question, uh, a good question here is, do we know the burst time a priority? No, all right, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So burst time is some magical prediction of the future, which we're gonna have to address in a moment. However, I can tell you after the fact, if I've observed what happened, I know what the burst time was because I know how long it ran, okay? So in the next few slides, assume that what's happening here is I say, well, I knew how long that was gonna run and I'm just playing with the scheduling to see what's different, okay? We'll get to where burst time comes from in a bit, okay? Because nothing we're doing uh, is based on burst time yet. But so process one is, it's got at least 53 uh, cycles it's got to run. And so it's going to run for 20 and then the time out is going to happen and it'll get be put on the end of the ready queue. And the next one, which is process two is going to come up, but it's only going to get to run for eight. So why does process two only run for eight instead of 20? Because it's done, right? It doesn't have anything else to do. So it finishes at eight. Process three comes around, runs for its 20. Process four runs for 20. Process one gets back again. It gets to run for 20. Okay. Process two doesn't run because it's gone. Process three runs for another 20. And here's the rest of it. We won't uh, bore you with all the remaining details. But if we were to com uh, compute the waiting time, we would see that we have get uh, 72 for process one. 20 for process two, 85 for process three, and 88 for process four. And we can come up with average waiting time and average completion time, which are these two numbers, 66 and a quarter and 104 and a half. Okay. So the good thing here is, uh, now, this is a good question that was posted. What happens if somebody uh, uses fork to create way too much 
uh, way, way too many processes and thereby take this over. Okay, so right now we're talking about a situation where every process, not necessarily every user, but every process is given an equal amount of time. Now, the way you start dealing with malicious users, like is being talked about in the chat here, is that's when you start noticing that uh, a given user has too many processes or they're creating them too frequently, and you put a restriction on how rapidly they're able to create them or how many they're able to create. Okay, but good, good observation there. If somebody creates a lot of processes, they can tie up everybody else because we are really giving equal weight to every process right now. So round robin, pros and cons. One, it's better for short jobs. How do I know that? Well, if you look, uh, this short job P2 got to run starting at cycle 20 rather than waiting until cycle 53. So the fact that we're running things round robin means those short jobs come up much quicker than they would in the first, first come first serve basis, okay? So how do we, let's just look at a couple examples. So suppose we have two tasks, one with a burst link of 10 and one with a burst link of one. If we run them first come first serve, we uh, get an average response time of 10.5 with a quantum of 10, because notice the quantum of 10 basically just runs T1 to completion and T2 comes afterwards. With a quantum of five, what happens is uh, we run T1 for five and then T2 gets to run. So if you notice the slightly smaller quanta half of the quanta here basically gives us better response time, okay? Now you could say, well, this is interesting. Why don't we just set Q equal to, you know, 0 0.0001, okay? And, and why don't we set Q equal to the smallest number we can come up with to get things more responsive? Overhead, yes, good answer. So switching is expensive. So here is an example where the two threads are the same length uh, burst time. And there, if the quanta is 10 versus one, we get equal uh, responsiveness, okay? And why is that? Well, that's just because they're both equal burst length. And so the fact that the quanta are equal, treat them similarly, okay? Uh, if we have burst length that's uh, quanta equal one and the quanta gets too small, notice what's interesting here is our average response time actually went up. And the reason is that this green thing actually ended up taking longer, uh, it had to wait more because it ended up having to wait a little bit for the blue one because of the interleaving. So just because we have a small slice doesn't necessarily mean that um, the average completion time necessarily goes down. So you have to be a little careful here, okay? Now, um, how do you implement round robin in the kernel? Well, uh, you start with a FIFO queue just like in first come first serve, but you have a timer, okay? And the timer goes off on a regular basis. You set the quantum. Um, how do you set the quantum? Well, that's actually a configuration parameter in the kernel. But as I mentioned, usually it's set to 10 or 100 milliseconds uh, if you don't change anything, All right? And a timer interrupt goes off and you use that to take the current uh, thread off of the CPU and pull the next one off the ready queue. So this we've been talking about pretty much since uh, day one, actually, we just weren't calling it that. And of course, uh, you have to be careful to synchronize things and so on so that uh, the queues don't get messed up in the process. All right. So this is all about project two scheduling. So you're going to get to start thinking about this when project two shows up, you get to actually implement some scheduling. Okay. That's something to look forward to. So how do you choose the time slice? If it's too big, we end up uh, with response time suffering. If it's infinite, we get back FIFO. If it's too small, we have throughput suffering because there's way too much overhead and switching. Um, actual choices of time slice, uh, the initial uh, Unix, which was intended more for a batch mode, was about a second, which means that when people are typing rapidly, you just, you were not seeing responsiveness, okay? Um, and you could end up, if you had three processes, you could end up with three seconds per uh, keystroke. And so um, you're trying to balance short job performance and long job, long job throughput. And that's where this 10 to 100 milliseconds kind of comes into play. Uh, if you know anything about HCI, you know that um, that 10 to 100 millisecond uh, range is kind of where the responsiveness comes into uh, play as well for responsiveness for other things that humans can notice, okay? 
the typical context switching overhead is like 0.1 milliseconds to a millisecond. And so they're really targeting about a 1% overhead, uh, no more in context switching. Um, now the question of can you have the, the uh, scheduler discriminate priority by program ID or user ID? Absolutely, we'll get there. Okay, because we're doing, right now we've only been treating everything exactly the same. And so we'll see, uh, you can imagine that might or might not be the right thing to do. Okay, so comparisons between first come first serve and round robin. So assume there's zero cost context switching just for the moment. Is our round robin always better? Uh, well, here's a simple example where 10 jobs each take 100 seconds of CPU time, a round robin scheduler quantum of one second, and all jobs start at the same time. Okay, so if you look, if we're doing FIFO, what happens is the first job runs for 100 uh, seconds, the second one for 100 seconds, and so on. And when we're done, we end up at uh, the thousandth second, second 1,000. If we're doing round robin and we're circling every second, what happens is the first job isn't done until uh, cycle 991, and then the second one finishes and so on. And so in this situation, the average response time is tremendously worse in the round robin case than it would be in the FIFO case. So if you're talking about a lot of identical, very long jobs, round robin is just not the right thing to do. All right, and that's because you slice everything up in little pieces and therefore the jobs have to run for, um, you have to interleave for many, many uh, periods before they finally finish. And of course, when we put context switching uh, overhead back in, that becomes really bad. Okay, and the cache state has to be shared. And so I just can't keep, uh, can't overemphasize this as an issue. Um, in the FIFO case, if I get to run for 100 seconds, I get all of the cache for that one job and the processor runs, you know, it hums along like a race car. Here, if I'm switching over and over and over again, um, the cache state doesn't get a lot of time to, uh, to build up. Now, of course, those of you who are really paying attention realize that one second is pretty long in uh, CPU time, but um, certainly uh, FIFO gives you much better use of the cache. And here's a kind of an interesting thing. So here's, uh, here's an example of um, first come first serve scheduling for uh, process one, two, three, and four, who happen to, you know, process one shows up, then process two, then process three, then process four. If I had sort of, uh, you know, uh, I was an Oracle and I knew the future, I could reorder them to give me my best first come first serve behavior, which would be to do the shortest one first, then the next one, then the next one, and then the next one, okay? Um, yes, the colors are eye searing, isn't that wonderful? Um, so if we look at uh, this, the best first come first serve basically gives us an average wait time of 31 and a quarter, whereas the worst is 83 and a, and a half. And the completion time, the best first come first serve, everything's done with an average time of 69 and a half, Whereas the worst case, it's average 121 and three quarters. So this is the vast difference between first come first serve, best and worst case. In the middle is for instance, a quanta of eight, gives us a wait time of 57 and a quarter that's kind of between the two, right? And a completion time of 95 and a half, which is kind of between the two. So the thing you can get out of this other than uh, aren't these uh, vibrant colors vibrant is that um, by using round robin, we can find a way without knowing anything about the jobs or when they arrive to come up with a fair to middle in uh, response time, wait time and completion time, okay? And that's why round robin is often used as a default simple policy because just by switching, you kind of get rid of the worst behavior of FIFO, okay? And then we could go in the middle here and look at some other options. Uh, it's kind of interesting that, you know, there isn't any obvious best quanta because as you notice, uh, as I get out from eight uh, on either side, things go up and so on. And so, you know, the pro another problem with uh, round robin is, you know, what's the ideal quanta? Well, you pick one that works pretty well for everything and you stick with it, it's the, it's the standard thing, all right? Um, notice here, that the P2 is the shortest uh, job, okay? And notice that the difference between best and worst is horrendously bad for P2, right? So the best first come first serve is zero wait time and the worst is 145. The best completion time is eight. 
and the worst is 153. So that poor P2, man, it's affected by scheduling because it's short. P3 is the longest. Look at that. It hardly even notices, right? The best first come, first serve, you know, it has to wait on average, you know, on average 85, the worst zero. Um, the completion time is 153 or 68. Yeah, you know, there is some difference there, but mostly the long jobs don't notice and the short jobs really do. So what we're getting out of these kind of scheduling decisions we're making are really targeting how can we give ourselves better responsiveness while not disturbing the long things that need to run efficiently. And by and large, the long things don't really notice too much, right? Unless you really give continuous priority to short things so the long ones never run, that's a problem. But by and large, the short ones uh, basically do better if you, if you uh, schedule. And those are the ones that the users care about, okay? So how do we, good. So there's a question here, how do we know what's short and what's long? Right now, all of the things we've done are oblivious to the length. We don't know anything about the burst time. What we're doing is analyzing what happened after we found out. But you could imagine we start remembering things like the last time P2 uh, woke up, it was really short, therefore it might be really short again. Very good, okay? And so the hardware is doing the interrupts to handle the keystrokes coming in, but ultimately the operating system has to take over to actually forward the resulting keystrokes to the right application. So yes, the hardware does what it can, but eventually the device driver has to take over and then that has to forward on to user threads. Okay. Um, now, Suppose that we want to um, talk about handling differences in importance uh, between different threads, okay? That was brought up earlier, and we could start doing something called priority queue, okay? And the priority queue is uh, something like this, where we have different priorities, and we run everything from the, lowest, or from the highest priority first, and then go on to the next ones down, and as long as we have really high priority jobs, then uh, we run those at the expense of the lower priority ones. Now this question uh, that showed up in the chat, uh, can't we hard code keystrokes to be handled every 50 milliseconds, whatever, you have to have a, a scheduler that can know how to take over or preempt from uh, a long running job in the instance of a keystroke, okay? And priority is something you could do. So you could make um, threads handling uh, user uh, events to be higher priority than one's not, okay? That could be an option, okay? And uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to know for sure uh, that this thread always ought to be given the highest priority because there could be situations where things absolutely have to run and your highest, pr highest priority thing just keeps running and everything else doesn't run, okay? And you start getting into live lock problems. So, um, and you don't always know what ought to be the highest priority job unless a user tells you, and then you don't always believe them because everybody's gonna always say, well, my thing is the most important. So that's why scheduling is such a tricky thing, right? How do you know the right scheduling policy to make everybody happy? So the execution plan in a priority scheduler is always execute highest priority runnable jobs to completion, and you could say that each queue in this could be processed round robin with some time quanta, okay? And so in this scenario here, perhaps priority three is highest. Um, make sure you always know for sure what your highest priority is before you make a conclusion. Um, sometimes zero is the highest in some scenarios. But here we're gonna say three is the highest. We could handle the jobs in priority three in round robin where we just keep cycling through all the priority threes until there are no jobs left and then we move on to priority two and if a new priority three one comes along we'll immediately preempt and start running priority three again so that's how um, a priority scheduler works the problems that show up are among other things starvation where lower priority jobs don't ever get to run because of high priority ones and ultimately there's forms of deadlock or priority inversion which is closer to a live lock uh, which happens with a low priority task grabs a lock needed by a high priority one. So imagine here the job six is run along and it grabs a lock and then job one comes along and job one tries to run and it tries to grab the lock, but it can't because job six has got it, okay? So that is a priority inversion. 
Now that simple case I gave you where there are only two threads in the system, it turns out it's not a problem. Why is that? So why job six has the lock, job one tries to run and grab the lock, and, uh, but it's being held up. How, do we, how does that resolve? Anybody figure that one out? So job three tries to grab the lock, it goes to sleep. Who gets to run again? Job six, job six eventually finishes, gives up the lock, and immediately job one gets to run because they're high priority. So that one resolves, okay? But this comment about giving priority to the job with the lock is important because it could be, uh, if there were many jobs in the system, what really ought to happen is priority three, uh, ought to hand its priority to priority zero, job six, long enough for six to release the lock and then let job one uh, run. That's called priority donation, and you get to try that out uh, in, in uh, project two, get to figure out how to implement that. But the other thing that's interesting about this high priority, this priority inversion problem, is if you have a third task, okay, so job six has the lock, job one's trying to grab it, gets put to sleep, job four, is an intermediate task, it starts to run and it's running continuously. Now we have a problem. And the reason we have a problem is job one needs to run, but it can't because it's waiting for job six, which won't run because job four is running, okay? And this is, uh, this is a situation where this won't resolve, okay? Now the question is why is this a priority scheduling issue? The answer is because we've set up a scenario where priority two is running, continuously, but priority one is higher priority, but it can't run because it's waiting for the low priority six. So we have a priority inversion where um, job four is essentially pre preventing, you could look at it this way, job one from running uh, because it's preventing job six from releasing the lock. Okay, now uh, what's interesting about this uh, is this kind of priority inversion is exactly what uh, almost toasted the Martian uh, rover um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that um, maybe next time. Uh, but there was a situation where a low priority job grabbed a lock on a bus and a medium priority job was running, but the high priority thing needed to get in there. And uh, there was a timer that figured out there was a problem and it would keep rebooting the rover, but it would get stuck in this priority inversion situa situation. Um, so how do you fix this? Well, you need some sort of dynamic priorities got to adjust the base level priority somehow up or down based on heuristics. And one thing, like I said, is this priority donation where job one, as it's going to sleep, gives priority to job six because it knows who's, wait, who's holding the lock. All right. So what about fairness? So this strict priority scheduling between queues is unfair. You run the highest and then the next and so on. Um, long running jobs may never get the CPU. Uh, there was an urban legend for a long time that in Multics, which was one of the original uh, uh, multiprocessor um, and multiprocess machines running at MIT, that they finally shut the machine down years later and they found a 10-year-old job that was still running. Now, that's just an urban legend. It wasn't true, but the idea is there, right? The idea that uh, things that are running in a priority world might prevent something else from ever running that was a background task. And so there's a Basically, the trade-off here is fairness, which is everybody gets to run, is being hurt by average response time. Okay, um, and if you're asking about would the priority uh, inversion be resolved when the intermediate task finishes, maybe unless there are other intermediate tasks. I mean, the fact that you have a high priority task means you want it to run right away, and the fact that something lower is preventing it means you've completely uh, taken over the priority scheme that was the designer came up with. That's a problem. So how do you implement fairness? Well, you could give each queue some fraction of the CPU. So if there's one wrong, long running job and 100 short ones, um, you know, what do you do? Well, it's sort of like express lanes at a supermarket. You know, sometimes the express lanes get so long, uh, you get better service by going into the other lines. And so maybe there's a way to figure out how to give some uh, CPU sort of to every queue. Uh, maybe you increase priority of jobs that don't give service. Next time I'm gonna tell you about uh, several variants of Unix schedulers, including the order one scheduler that was uh, Linux standard for a long time, 
up until like 2.4. Um, and it basically had this dynamic scheme where it would figure out and it would continuously adjust priorities up and down based on things like figuring out, well, this is, uh, must be an interactive task because the bursts are all short, so the priorities go up. But then this thing runs for a long time, the priorities go down. And there are all these really complicated heuristics trying to adjust priorities up and down uh, based on what it thought that was happening. Okay, So that is something people have tried, but it's really hard to get right. Okay, But what if we knew the future? Okay, So shortest job first uh, says you run whatever job has the least amount of computation to do. Okay, And this is sometimes called shortest time to completion first. There's also a preemptive version which basically says uh, whatever job has the shortest remaining time first, let it run. Um, a preemptive version of SJF would be, you know, if a job arrives and has a shorter time, then it gets to run. Okay. But what's uh, the problem with this, and the reason I'm showing a crystal ball here is you have to have an idea for every job in your queue, which one's the shortest remaining one. Okay. And you can apply this to the whole program or the current CPU burst, what have you. But the idea is to somehow, if we knew the future, um, get the short jobs out of the system. Um, it has a really big effect on short jobs and responsiveness, but only a small effect on the long ones. And the result is better average response time. All right, so shortest job first or shortest remaining time first are the best you can do at minimizing average response time. So you can prove that these are optimal if you knew the future. Um, to compare SRTF with first come first serve, what if all the jobs are the same length? Well, shortest remaining time first just becomes the same. And the reason is if you have a bunch of jobs that are all the same length and you start running even one of them, it's now shortest from that point on and it just runs to completion. Okay, so SRTF degenerates into FIFO when everything's exactly the same length. If the jobs have varying lengths, then the short jobs always get to run over the long ones. So this is almost like in that, uh, that uh, eye peeling colored slide earlier, where I showed you the difference between the best first come first serve and the worst, this is like SRTF could somehow figure out what the best uh, first come first serve was by always picking the shortest jobs and running them first. Okay, so now a question of could we use a neural net policy? Maybe, um, but let's, let's talk about the benefits here for a moment. Okay, so assuming we can predict the future. So um, here's an example where we have uh, A and B are long CPU bound jobs that run for a week. C is an IO bound job where you run for a millisecond of CPU and then you enter the, uh, the disk and run for nine milliseconds. And then you run for a millisecond to figure out what to grab next in nine milliseconds. So this C job is kind of like something you might get if you were copying from one disk to another. Okay. And um, if C is running by itself, notice that you get 90% of the disk, okay? Only if C runs by well by itself. If I somehow disturb this one millisecond in here and take much longer, then my, my disk portions are always gonna take nine milliseconds, but the time to get there is gonna be longer and I'm not gonna be keeping the disk busy, okay? A or B always get 100% of the CPU and so they can, they can run well um, for long periods of time. Okay, and you know, here I'm saying that they run for a week and C runs for short periods of time. So with first come, first serve, what happens is once A or B gets in, then C uh, doesn't get to run for a week and I get no bandwidth out of the disk. What about round robin or shortest remaining time first? Well, here let me show you an example. Here's an example of round robin with a 100 millisecond time slice where C runs for a millisecond um, and then while its disk is going on for that nine milliseconds, A runs for its 100 millisecond time slice. Then B runs for 100 milliseconds, and then C gets to go for its millisecond, and then it gets disk I.O. And what happens in this round robin with 100 milliseconds, which might be default on Linux, is you get a 4.5% of the disk rather than our target 90% of the disk use. If I get my round robin to be a millisecond, I've got all of this switching and overhead. And now I get my disk utilization back to 90%, but boy, this looks very wasteful, right? On the other hand, SRTF does exactly the right thing. Why is that? Well, C runs because it's short. And then while the disk is going on, C is not even on the queue. A, let's say, starts running. And A, as soon as it starts running, is now shorter than B. So A will always get to run in preference to B. 
A runs until the disk interrupt comes back, and now C is scheduled to run, but C is shortest, and so C gets to run. And in this instance, I get back my 90% disk utilization uh, entirely, but I have 100% CPU utilization. So this looks pretty good, right? Again, assuming I know the future. So problems here might be starvation. If you noticed earlier, this particular oops example I gave here is not running B. So B is starved until A is done, and then B gets to run. Okay. So SRTF can lead to star starvation if you have lots of smaller jobs, and large jobs never get to run. So you need to predict the future. And uh, well, some systems might ask the user, well, how long does this task take? How long does this task take? I challenge you, when was the last time you knew exactly how many milliseconds some code was going to run? And probably not uh, until after you ran it once, right? So, um, and the other thing is, you know, users, not only are users clueless, but they're not always uh, honest. Okay, they may be dishonest purely because they're hoping to optimize their use. Okay, so the bottom line is you can't really know how long a job will take for sure. If we could predict that, you know, I have some stock to sell you, right? But um, we can use SRTF as a yardstick for other policies because it's optimal, can't do better. So the pros and cons are it's optimal um, because it's got the optimal average response time, but the downside is it's very hard to predict the future and it's really unfair. Okay. Now, if you hold on for a moment, uh, I want to give you a little bit more on this. So first question, and this was great, it was already brought up in the chat, is how do you predict the future? Well, we, do, we predict the future using all of those techniques that people use right now to predict the future. Um, the great thing about CPUs uh, and typical applications is there's a lot of predictability in them. And so if we want to change policy based on past behavior, um, we basically exploit that predictability. So an example might be that SRTF with an estimated burst length, um, we could use an estimator function, okay? Like a Kalman filter, all right? Or here's a, the simplest Kalman filter, which is really exponential averaging, where I have some alpha and I just predict the average, okay? Oh, no Kalman filters has just been uh, declared on the chat. Um, I, will, I will say that Kalman filters do have their place. Um, you're welcome to put some sort of machine learning in here. Um, there's always a trade-off, however, between um, the cost of doing the prediction and, uh, and the benefit because there is overhead to doing the prediction. So um, anyway, as you can see, there are ways for us to predict the future. Okay. Um, another thing we could do is uh, now let's target some of these different places. So one of the things that is wrong with SRTF is it's very unfair. So here's another alternative, which I want to introduce called lottery scheduling. This is going to be very short. But the idea is you give each job some number of lottery tickets. And on each time slice, you're going to randomly pick a, a winner. And uh, on average, the CPU time is proportional to the number of tickets. Okay? And so you assign tickets. Uh, just like in SRTF, you could give short jobs more tickets and long jobs less tickets. And then probabilistically, the short jobs will get more probability to run than the long ones. Okay, and to avoid starvation, since every job potentially gets at least one ticket, we know that when we cycle our way through all the tickets, uh, that everybody will have gotten to run a little. Okay, so this, uh, unlike SRTF, which could actually shut somebody out indefinitely, lottery scheduling doesn't. And lottery scheduling is closely related to other um, types of scheduling, which are basically um, trying to optimize for, uh, for average CPU time, okay? So the advantage over strict priority scheduling, it behaves gracefully. So as you add more items then, um, and you redistribute the, the uh, tickets graceful, uh, gracefully, everybody still gets to run. Okay. So here's an example. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get you out of here pretty closely um, to study some more. But um, for instance, if I have one short job and one long job, and I give 10 tickets to short jobs and one ticket to the long job, then um, the percent of CPU each short job gets ends up being 91% and the long jobs get 9%. Well, how do I know if they're short or long? Well, I use something like uh, my predictability, my average filter earlier. Um, if I have uh, two long jobs, they each get 50%. Well, that sounds good. Um, if I have two short jobs, they each get 50%. Okay. Now, if there are too many short jobs to give a reasonable response time, uh, 
then perhaps we're overloading the, the uh, overall machine. Okay, so there is a point at which scheduling just can't fix the fact that you don't have enough resources. Okay, so that's a, that's a topic for another day. So how do you evaluate a scheduling algorithm? And um, we'll leave you with this thought here. Um, you can model it, okay? So these scheduling algorithms are mathematical things. You can come up with a queuing theory uh, evaluation and apply some, um, some uh, jobs to it mathematically and figure out how that goes, although that's typically a very fragile type of analysis. It's very hard to be generalized. Um, you could, you know, uh, you would come up with something just using average queuing theory rather than sort of transient queuing theory. That's a little simpler, but still not exact. Um, you can build a simulator, which actually puts, uh, puts in a trace of how things are actually going and then simulates the results. That's often what happens with schedulers. Um, sometimes people just go ahead and uh, toss a new scheduler onto a system and run it and see what happens. Um, schedulers, unfortunately, as we're going to talk about next time, can get so complicated that people have no idea what they're doing and why. And that oftentimes leads to people uh, complete breaks in code. So uh, the O1 scheduler in, um, in Linux was tossed out rather unceremoniously by Linux to uh, come up with the CFS scheduler, and that was because it was getting so complicated, nobody understood it anymore. Okay, so we'll finish this up next time, but we've been talking about scheduling now. We talked about round robin scheduling, which is the simplest default scheduler. Um, you give each thread a small amount of CPU when it executes, and you cycle between all the ready threads. The pros is it's better for short jobs, um, which gives us a, a way in to optimizing for responsiveness. We talked about shortest job first and shortest remaining time first. So the idea there is you run whatever job has the least amount of computation to do, and uh, it's optimal for average response time. The downside is you have to predict the future. And we talked about uh, various ways of predicting the future, including uh, various versions of Kalman filters like just the moving window average. Um, you could have some machine learning example or something more complicated. Um, we're gonna get to multi-level feedback scheduling next time, which is a, like a, happy combination of a couple of things where you have queues of different priorities. And those queues each have a different scheduler on them. And at the top, we have short quanta. And at the bottom, we have FIFO. And so we're trying to approximate SRTF in a way that um, optimizes for really short jobs and gives them uh, CPU quickly, but still gives you um, good behavior for the long jobs. All right, and we also talked about lottery scheduling uh, giving each thread a priority dependent number of tokens. All right, so I think with that, we'll bid you adieu. Good luck tomorrow. Um, I'm pulling for all you guys. I'm sure it's going to be great. And I hope, you, uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend after that so that once you're done uh, with the test, you can get yourself a little bit of relaxing time. All right, goodbye, everybody. Good luck.